of Boston's Literary District, and Dick is the fifth in our uh, Literary Lunch Break series at South Station. I'm proud to introduce to you today not just a terrific celebrated writer and a man of conscience, but also a friend, Dick Lair. And he doesn't disappoint with his latest book, The Birth of a Nation, How a Legendary Filmmaker and a Crusading Editor Reignited America's Civil War. So I'm, gonna, I'm here today uh, to talk about my latest book, which features, as Larry said, a largely forgotten civil rights leader and Boston newspaper editor, a man by the name of William Monroe Trotter. And I want to talk about his role in the civil rights protests a century ago, literally a hundred years ago, against the famous film by the legendary filmmaker D.W. Griffin it was called The Birth of a Nation. Has anyone in this immediate audience here, have you ever seen The Birth of a Nation? Do you know about it a little bit? Okay, for those of you who don't, it was a more than three hour movie about the Civil War and Reconstruction. And it was dramatized mainly through the lives of two families, the Camerons from the fictional town of Piedmont, South Carolina, and the Stonemans from the North. The problem, and, and it was about one of the nation's biggest stories, of course, the epic war between the states. The problem with the movie, and it was a big one to be sure, was that the Kentucky-born director, D.W. Griffith, his slant, his romanticized view of antebellum South, the lost cause, his blunt, crudely racist portrayal of blacks and freed slaves, his treatment of the Ku Klux Klan as heroes during Reconstruction who rode to the rescue and restored order to the lawlessness and chaos brought on by ex-slaves. Therein lies the rub in this historic film, its appalling bigotry. Everywhere it was shown, black Americans and their supporters were horrified and outraged. And that's the heart of my book, the retelling of this dramatic confrontation over the movie between civil rights leaders and their supporters and the pioneering filmmaker Griff Griffith, who if you go to film school or have taken a film course, a Survey American film course, he's the starting point. He's the anchor of any film course, and they teach this film everywhere. And this protest was a battle waged across the country, but most notably right here in Boston, where the protest was fiercest and played out for months, with the crusading editor Trotter at the forefront. It's a story that unfolds on a big canvas the early 20th century, covering lots of big ideas, and with a roll call of historic, larger-than-life figures who have more than cameos in, 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 in the drama. James Michael Curley, for example, is mayor at the time. He plays a big role in this. The president, Woodrow Wilson, has a major role in this story. And in many ways, there's something for everyone, for students of history, for sure, but also for anyone interested in such vexing concerns as civil rights and civil liberties. Concerns not just rooted in 1915, but resonating throughout the century and into this one. Just think Black Lives Matter, and you'll get it. Now besides Griffith, as I've mentioned, this, the main character, I think, in my main interest was William Monroe Trotter. And until about five years ago, I knew very little about him. But then I was reading an article that made mention of him, and it grabbed my attention. He was a Boston newspaper editor, a civil rights leader, an 1895 graduate from Harvard and the first black Phi Beta Kappa at Harvard. And I'm going, wow, how come I don't know this guy? It was kind of embarrassing. I should know him. I'm a writer. I'm a journalist. I teach journalism at BU. I'm interested in these issues. How did this guy get by me? But he did. And I started thinking and reading, and I might do a biography of him because he seemed to have been lost to time. But then I got to the year 1915 and his protest against the birth of a nation, and that became my aha moment because that was the story I wanted to tell through which to channel so much more. So it was Trotter who turned out to be my entry into this titanic clash as the protest was carried out for months throughout the spring of 1915 and involved mass demonstrations featuring thousands of protesters and a small army of Boston police that sometimes turned violent. Over the course of several months, the protest played out in just about every venue imaginable. In Boston City Hall, and I'm going to read briefly an excerpt that, that features that scene in Boston City Hall, in the courthouse, on the streets of Boston, and then at, over at the State House. And with Trotter at the forefront, and his advocacy of what was known as direct protest action, 
I kept stra scratching my head and going, what year is this, 1915? Because it seemed so 1960-ish. And of Monroe Trotter, the scholar and journalist Lerone Bennett has written, he was, quote, a true pioneer, decades ahead of his time, a leader who laid the first stone of the modern protest movement. So in effect, I climbed onto his back for a ride into a phenomenal protest story, one I have to say that was largely overshadowed by other events from that time. I'm thinking mainly of World War I and the U.S. entry into it, certainly a big, big event that understandably swallowed up many of the other happenings during this period, starting around 1914. So by doing this book, I wanted to bring back to life this story so that any discussion of the controversial and historic film, The Birth of a Nation, had as a resource this narrative history that put the film into a larger context of its time and place and captured dramatically and in detail the offense taken by black Americans and supporters of civil rights. Now, as I mentioned, I wanted to grab the book and, and read, us, uh, brief, brief, read briefly from it. Um, and the excerpt I've show, chosen is from early April 1915. And Monroe Trotter was out of town on a speaking tour, okay? But the, the film had opened in February in Los Angeles amid some percolating controversy. And then it moved to New York City's Liberty Theater in March. Um, where again, some of the protests started to gain a little more momentum. But D.W. Griffith, the filmmaker, and his producers knew that the big, big city was Boston, given its abolitionist history and whatnot. And their next stop was Boston, opening in early April of, of 1915. At, at, it was then called the Tremont Theater. You know where the Lowe's Theater is today over on Tremont Street? That's where the Tremont Theater was located, and that's where the film opened in 1915. And Trotter and everyone else and his supporters and the, and the newly, you know, relatively new Boston branch of the NAACP, they were waiting word for when the movie was actually coming to town. And Trotter, at this moment, happened to be out of town. He was in Baltimore on a speaking tour when he got word that, that the film was arriving and moving into the city. And so this is a scene that tracks Trotter's return to Boston. He rode a train right into this station, South Station, at the beginning of the week. And he, he and his other fellow supporters were preparing and getting ready for what I'll call round one in a, in a, in a many round knockout kind of battle against D.W. Griffith to try to run the movie out of Boston, okay? Um, and the first round was going to be before, over at City Hall, before Mayor James Michael Curley, who was legendary for censoring things, uh, you know, things of the arts especially. He had, he had what was known as the bare leg rule, where if there was a woman on a, on a, on a, a stage in Boston whose legs were bare, he would, he would shut it down. He had that, that, as mayor, the power of censorship and, and along those lines. So this was a different kind of, of, of challenge. You had this movie that was, you know, horribly bigoted and racist, and, and Trotter and his supporters um, were arguing that it too should be censored as, you know, he, they didn't use this term, but, but arguably as hate speech, that it crossed the line of any kind of First Amendment protection. And Trotter and his supporters believed that, that given Curley's reputation as a censor, um, that they had a good shot at it. Uh, in addition, Trotter had rounded up and he had, uh, you know, sort of supported Curley with black voters uh, in, his, in, his, in his race for mayor. So politically, too, he thought he, he was in good shape when this thing went to City Hall. So uh, this is where I'll start. Monroe Trotter arrived home from Baltimore to find the region in the throes of a drought, the worst in 75 years, according to the Weather Bureau. Instead of a normally wet March in 1915, Boston had seen only a few so-called fugitive flakes of snow. Newspaper coverage included residents' complaint about the nasty dust and dirt on the city's streets. And early in the afternoon of Wednesday, April 7, 1915, Trotter emerged from this sand and fog to climb the white granite steps of Boston City Hall. He passed the ornamental columns, walked through the huge front doors, and entered the large first floor lobby. 
His destination was the aldermanic chamber on the second floor, where Mayor James M. Curley had scheduled a hearing on short notice at the request of Trotter's literary group and the Boston chapter of the NAACP. The moment marked the first time Trotter and D.W. Griffith had ever appeared in the same room together. The Boston militant was an earnest looking man of medium height dressed in a white shirt, a dark tie, and his trademark coal black suit, which, as usual, could have used a fresh pressing. Trotter did not make any kind of public pronouncement about it, but the day marked his 43rd birthday. He had filled out a bit since his Harvard days, wore a mustache, and his hair was turning a striking iron gray. Joining him to argue against the film were a number of prominent civil rights activists and Boston clergy, including lawyer Moorfield Story, as well as settlement house worker Mary White Ovington, a co-founder of the NAACP. The birth of the nation's creator, whom the press was calling the greatest American filmmaker ever, was taller than Trotter probably expected. An athletic looking six footer with an aquiline nose who favored stylish pinstriped suits and often sported a derby hat. Griffith, now 40, seemed comfortable in public, projecting an almost regal bearing befitting a prominent director and a southerner with an aristocratic pretension. He too had come ready for battle, standing with his attorney, John Cusack, business manager, Henry McMahon, and also manager of the Tremont Theater, where the film was to open. The hearing room was large, 40 feet square with 20 foot ceilings, but not large enough for the nearly 200 spectators, mostly Negroes, who had turned out. Those unable to find a chair sat on windowsills, leaned against the perimeter walls, and stretched out into the wide corridor near the mayor's office. Several Boston police officers were on hand, and shortly after 3 p.m., Curley silenced the chattering so that the hearing could begin. The first thing he did after calling the session to order was to read the state statute that empowered him to forbid a show if he found it indecent or immoral. Because Trotter and his fellow opponents had called for the hearing, they went first, and for the next two hours, a series of witnesses presented their case against the film. Included were the local leaders of the NAACP, there was Mary Ovington from New York, the social worker, and they gave their testimony. They bantered with Curley, who had some tough questions for them. And then they saved Monroe Trotter for last. And so after nearly 90 minutes of other testimony, he stood in the crowded chamber to deliver the equivalent of a closing argument at trial, bidding to sway the mayor with a speech that pulled together the evidence others had presented while embroidering his own to it. So these words would build to a climax and left a final and indelible impression to leave Curley with, no, with one option and one option only, to ban Griffith's film. Trotter began by telling the mayor he had read Dixon's novel, which is the basis for the film, and also that he had seen the movie The Birth of a Nation, the point being that he spoke credibly with first-hand knowledge. He had done his homework because for the next hour, he spoke with a detailed familiarity of the movie and a honed sense of horror at its depiction of Negroes. Trotter reiterated the opponent's position that the whole purpose of the movie was to, quote, disparage the colored race. He charged that portraying the Negro as obsessed with, quote, preying upon and raping white girl children was propaganda pure and simple to convert the North to belief in the South's repression and disenfranchisement. He then backed up re rhetoric with examples and evidence, zooming in on numerous specific scenes, citing, for example, when Silas Lynch, the acting lieutenant governor during Reconstruction, locks the maiden Elsie in his room and ties and gags her to force her into marriage, or when guffawing Negro legislators celebrate passage of a law permitting interracial marriage in the South. These scenes, he argued, quote, were all so worked up as to rouse the passions of white men to a hostile, retaliatory, even murderous feeling toward colored men. Trotter enlarged on his argument, describing the societal co context in which the film was debuting, quote, the extreme degree of segregation, even in border states, and the denial of civil rights in northern states. He then turned his focus onto Curley himself, as if it were just the two of them, talking politics and personalities, all of it being local. 
He asked the mayor, the mayor to remember back to when he was a congressman, when Curley had made all Bostonians proud for the stand he took against bigotry and denounced lynching, quote, to the faces of Southern members of Congress. For that, Trotter had rallied Negro voters to turn out to help elect a mayor. And for that, reminded Trotter, Curley had promised to protect them. Now, he said, with the arrival of the birth of a nation, the Negro was depending on the mayor to deliver on that promise. He urged Curley to construe with liberality the censorship law, particularly the clause addressing the morals of the community because a film inspiring racial hatred, retaliation, and injury quote, certainly were moral feelings and lowered the morals. Trotter then stepped away from the table and to gain greater intimacy, moved in closer to the mayor. It was a signal that the editor of the Guardian newspaper was reaching his finale, in which he said the controversy marked a new kind of civil war, requiring Curley to draw the line against a film, quote, by a southerner seeking to flout Boston and her abolitionists. The mayor, he said, must stand up for his home city and her great men and protect his colored friends. With that, Trotter rested. And with that, I will stop. So hopefully that passage gives you a, a flavor of the narrative, the historical narrative, the story I'm telling in this book. And I'm not going to give any more away because it does go, it's, 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 a, it's a battle that goes on in several rounds um, where each side's uh, you know, making gains and then has setbacks. And it plays out, like I say, it starts in early this September, I mean early April 100 years ago, and continued through the month of May 100 years ago, well through the end of June before the outcome was determined. Um, and uh, like I said, I'll stop here. And if there's anyone who has any questions about the story or, or the movie, I'm happy to take them. Thanks for, for sitting down and listening.